Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have my friend from Michigan, Allison Apsey here. She is an incredible principal. And I actually had the opportunity to meet her, I don't know, it was like seven, eight, maybe even 10 years ago uh, at a conference. And what's been really amazing is I've been watching and following her journey because she's been sharing it um, as a principal, as an educator, as someone who gets the opportunity to um, speak to people in the world, as also an author. And I've had the opportunity to read her books, and we're going to talk about uh, her book Through the Lens today. Uh, but she is absolutely incredible doing some really amazing things with her staff right now um, and someone I consider a very good friend. And so, Allison, thank you so much for being here. And if you could just share kind of a little bit about your educational journey, kind of what you do today and how you got there, I think people would really love to hear that. Yeah, I, I thank you for the introduction and for having me. I love that you, um, you know, had such accolades about me as a principal because uh, I don't necessarily feel that right now. Like I'm a, a principal at home and nobody would ever have pictured that that's, that would be even in like our vocabulary or repertoire. Like I have this clear picture of how to be a pretty good principal in my school, but how to support families and students and staff from a distance has been a little bit of a, a challenge. So um, that's part of my journey now, just like all the other principals and educators around the world. But I am, I think I've been a principal for like 16 years of all different grade levels. And this is my sixth year at Quincy Elementary in Zeeland, Michigan. And um, I love our, we call ourselves the Q Crew. Um, just a fantastic group of educators. And I am so blessed. I call myself the luckiest principal in the world. And I'm not like just being cheesy about that. I really, really feel it. Um, I'm also a mom to two sons. I have an 18 year old and a 13 year old son. And um, my husband, Jim, and we live out in the woods in Michigan, near Lake Michigan, um, and have a pretty good life. I would rather be in school right now, but hey, if I have to be anywhere and in this five acres in the woods, it's a pretty good spot to be. So my journey really changed, George, when, when I met you at that MEMSPA conference and heard your keynote, because I was the type of principal when a problem was presented to me or, or I discovered a problem, I thought I needed to go into my office and think really hard and figure out the solution to that problem. Like uh, I thought uh, leaders, all the solutions needed to come from, you know, their own brains mm -hmm. and, and really meeting you and understanding the value of uh, a, a professional learning network. And I started blogging and sharing, you know, my thoughts, including my insecurities and problems I needed to solve and then connecting with other educators. And, um, I, you know, I, this definitely sounds cheesy, but it was really life changing to get <laughs> connected <sound> via <laughs> Twitter and Facebook. It's just the truth. And I mean, it was like serendipitous that like, you know, it was that conference, it was your keynote, it was the time of my life. It was, you know, being a leader of Quincy elementary, like all those things kind of came together and it not only changed my life professionally because in, in, in gaining a confidence yet vulnerability and humbleness and being even more of a learner, but it also changed me um, personally. It changed when you're, you're, you're more fulfilled overall. I think I'm a better mom, a better wife, you know, a better friend, family member. So uh, it's been quite a journey over the All, the all because of that one keynote. Um, I don't know, that, that, might, <laughs> that might be giving it a little bit too much credit. I'm just going to say it was, um, you changed my life. What does, what does that well, you did say life changing and then you said all those things, <laughs> right? So right, I, just, right. I just feel like, I'm, hey, thanks for being on the podcast and we'll see you later, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And here, here's the deal. We were talking about this, Allison, and like, I so appreciate the kind words and that really means a lot to me, but think about... Um, and I, this is a really important aspect. First of all, you were already doing incredible stuff before I met you and before that day. So that, that is a really important aspect of this too, right? But a lot of people hear myself, they hear people at a conference, um, you know, share something really uh, maybe inspiring, whatever. But at the end of the day, you have to do something, right? Like, at the, like what can I, you know, at that conference ever do for another person as a uh, more less than a spark, right? Like a spark there. 
But one of the reasons that we've actually connected is because all those things that you're sharing with me, all the things that you share that have made such a significant um, impact for you personally and professionally, I've been able to witness and be able to share through the, the willingness of you to share that journey. And so there's, there's a lot of times when we see that and then we don't do anything with it. And, and like you said, it's not because, you know, people don't want to, um, but there's, there's all those factors that come into it, where you are in your career. Uh, there's certain things I do now that people try to convince me to do five years ago and they were great ideas then, but I wasn't ready. Right. Like, yeah. you know, I wrote a book the, the exact moment I was ready to re write a book, but I was pushed to do it, you know, five years prior. And so it's really like, I, like I said, I appreciate the really kind words, but the credit really is all yours, the willingness to do um, all of that stuff. And, and like one of the things that I love about your work, Allison, is really you don't just talk about education. Like I feel people really connect with you because you're, they connect with you as a person that is a principal, not solely a principal. And so like how, when you share that stuff, is there like a fear of it? Like, do you get nervous sharing some of those personal aspects? Like, how does that process work for you? Yeah. So my, my first book, um, or even like my first blog, I remember right. sharing with you the first blog post I ever wrote was about me as a student and how I hated school. And I graduated from school saying, I don't know what I want to be, but I know I don't want to be a teacher because I never want to step foot in a K-12 building again. Mm -hmm. Like I really wanted to, I was, I really wished I wanted to explore a trade and like get trained in that trade and get out in the workforce and not have to deal with school and college. Um, but then I ended up having to take an educational psychology class because another psychology class was canceled and I had to get into a classroom and do some volunteer work. And I, I just discovered, I just looked at it from a different angle and discovered that I, I had this passion for wanting school to be a different experience for students. And, um, and then that just started a spark that led to me becoming a teacher. I didn't want to be a principal, but I became a leader in my school just by like the circumstances. And then that led to becoming a school leader. And I became a principal when I was 27 years old. I know you were really young too when, when you became a principal, but um, that, that journey to begin when you're 27, I don't even think I was fully mature at that time and trying to figure out how to lead a school was, um, it was a work in progress and I bless all of those teachers and students who are on that journey with me. Yeah. And I, well, first of all, I'm still very young, right? <laughs> well, you're older just, than me. So I just mean, like, no, no, I'm just, I'm very, young. So, <laughs> this gray in my beard is just, it's actually just salt from what I just ate. Uh, but the, but I think that's, that's part of it too, is we have to have that recognition. Like we always talk about, you know, um, if you, I always say this, that if you don't look back on your first year of teaching with a little bit of embarrassment, you're probably not really that good right now. Cause like, if you're still doing what you're doing the first year, and it doesn't mean that you weren't a great teacher in your first year, but part of the profession is there's necessary growth that has to happen. You learn different things, right? You do different things, but we don't recognize it. We don't recognize that as much as an administrator, right? There is an expectation that when you become a principal, you got it down, you're ready to go. Let's go. And so I think, you know, just you sharing that, um, because I, like I started, uh, as a principal, I think I was like 33 years old. Um, but there's things that I did then that I was proud of at the time that I look back and go, wow, like there's way better ways I could have done that now. And I think part of that, we have to be comfortable because do we, I don't know, I wonder what you think of this. Do we actually give the same grace? to an, um, a new principal that we do to a new teacher. Right. Well, no, <laughs> we so know why, that. Why do you think that, why do you think that is though? Like why, like I know they're, they, they're responsible for so many things, but and I'm not saying, you know, we don't want people that are incompetent, obviously, but you know, there should be some grace through that process. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think maybe to a certain extent, like I got to claim with my superintendent and assistant superintendent, like they said, like, you know, you get some grace for the first couple of years, but not necessarily from like the, my own school staff, right. you know, did, did, do we afford that same grace? I think we know that teachers are going to go into the classroom and they're going to struggle with classroom management. And there's a lot that they are going to need to learn on the job. But I don't think we, that we recognize that 
leading adults is so different than leading children. And there is definite overlap in the skill set mm-hmm. and the focus on relationships and, and empathy. But you, we go to college and learn how to lead children. I mean, I did go to grad school to try to learn how to lead adults, but we get into this profession because mm-hmm. we're, we're good at working with children and working with adults is a completely different ball game. And I think that's part of the, the reason like you were successful as a teacher, you know, flipping over to the leadership side should be no problem, no brainer, but um, there is a huge learning curve that yeah, we don't. I, I actually, and I think I, like, it's interesting because we, you know, we, we haven't really decided where this conversation is going um, because this, that's not how I do the podcast. We just have conversations and see where it leads to. But I actually can tell you straight up, I know some people that were amazing teachers who are not great principals. And I actually know some people who are not great teachers who are amazing principals. Yeah. Right. And so I don't yeah. know, like there, there's, there is different skill sets through that process. And, um, the idea of like, I hear people say, well, you know, you haven't taught in a long time, so you don't understand. Well, yeah, but we also principals, a lot of people haven't been in those positions, but then we, we often kind of judge like, this is what you should have done there. But, you know, leadership is a lot more complicated than that. And yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know, like, uh, you know, I, like I said, I don't know. Do you think that's, could you be an effective principal if you weren't necessarily an effective teacher? It's like, I'm sure people will share that. Like, what do you think about that? Is that a possibility? I, I, I think that's a possibility. Um, so, you know, then there's different kinds of principles. There's principles whose strengths are really like instructional leadership. Mm-hmm. There's principles whose strengths are, you know, like management and facilitation and logistics. And then there's principles who are really, relational and um you know help you feel supported as a person and and i think you know like an effective principal has to be a combination of all of those but right. there are principals who are really strong in a couple areas and and not as strong in in another area yeah. um you know i wouldn't consider myself like like com- strong in in every single area i have after 16 years i still have so much to learn yeah and that's Look, as I'm listening to you, one of the things I think, and I, I'm big into sports, you know this about me, um, some of the worst coaches in sports were actually some of the best players because they actually don't understand a player. Like Michael Jordan um, was not a great GM because he kind of expects everyone to play as hard as Michael Jordan. I think that's such a good point. And that's such an important leadership point is that you can't go in as a principal and expect every teacher to think like you, to behave like you, Mm -hmm. um, to be the person you were when you were a teacher. They have different strengths. They have different areas of growth and they have, we have to be okay that they're not us. And um, I think that that plays into that point. Yeah. And that, that actually is really crucial when we're looking at hiring, we're looking at, um, so when I looked at, looked at um, when I was hiring assistant, my assistant principal, when I first became a principal, I was actually looking at someone who was not like me. I didn't need, I already had me who right. thought like me. I needed someone who thought different, who had different experiences, uh, you know, and actually to be honest with you that people, um, people would actually like, some people might not be feel comfortable talking to me, but feel comfortable talking to this person. Right. I think really that's, you know, that's something that we think about in leadership and it's true in teaching too, right? Like I, I actually just wrote about this, the idea that um, you can, we can still do what's best for kids in different classrooms, but those look like different things in the way that we deliver, right? As long as we have that same focus of where we're going and what we're trying to do for our students, um, that's really important. And one of the things that I saw you do in Allison, I thought was really interesting and I, I know it was really helpful and it has resonated with the people I shared um, was, you know, check again because people are at different places that we said at, at different points of the work that we do. And when this all started happening, you did this, um, this student or the staff check-in, right? Cause people are all over the place. They're dealing with different things. Right. So kind of, can you talk about that and like what it actually, cause you didn't just, you actually didn't just stick with doing the staff, but I saw that it transitioned as well. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, so um, before the the COVID crisis hit, I was meeting with a small group of teachers and we were talking about ways that we're supporting students with checking in with students. So like when they first come in in the morning or after recess, seeing what kind of support student need, students need. And one of my teachers said, 
hmm, it would might be nice to check in with teachers also. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really good point. And so immediately I, I went in and I was, you know, could it be Kahoot? You know, I was like thinking about different ways that I could check in with teachers electronically. And I went and talked to a few teachers about some of the ideas I had and they're like, Allison, keep it simple. So we went with a Google form. It was just one question I emailed out on Monday morning and it's like, how are you feeling about the week ahead? Are, are you feeling great and prepared? Are you overwhelmed? But you know what, you're, you're gonna be okay. You need some TLC, you need some other kind of support and they can just click their response and, and type in you know, something other. So we started doing that and, and I had such a good turnout and then I knew that I had to act immediately on the responses that I was getting. If somebody said they needed TLC, they needed, I needed to respond to them that day. Otherwise this check-in was going to be right. pretty meaningless. So, I mean, I provided subs for a couple hours so teachers could get some grading done. Like whatever they needed, I just, we made it happen. And then all of a sudden I, I felt like we were cruising along. I was in tune with staff needs and then COVID hit and we couldn't be together in the building anymore. And I'm thinking, how am I going to know how to support them? Like now more than ever, they need my support. So um, I just changed the, the one question to just align with us not being together and ask them how I could support them. Again, Google form and I just did it mm -hmm. every Monday morning. Um, and it was everything from like, they're like, I'm bored, please let's learn something together to like, I have sick family members. And it was such a great form of communication. And I, I shared that out in a blog post and I shared it on Facebook and I have a lot of my family, my school families follow, we're connected on Facebook. And one of my parents said, hey, what do you think about doing a form like this for families? And so then I, I changed the Google form to adapt it to families and we did a Friday check-in with families and I added that to the blog post. Um, and that was another good tool to hear like, how, how are you doing? Do you have sick family members? Do you need anything? And you know, how can we support you? And I had a really good response in the beginning and it's kind of trickled off as, as we've moved along, but um, we have a, a few different other ways that we're connecting with families also. So, I mean, they weren't my ideas. Yeah, I, I think the, um, like I was, as I'm listening to you, one of the things I think about, sometimes I'm really upset with somebody, right? And you get really bothered and whatever, and you got to have that conversation. And then like, I'm so mad about it. And then they just say sorry, and it's like, okay. And it's just fixed, right? And I think the reason I bring that up is because as I'm listening to you and listening to that process, just that people are asked is probably pretty powerful. Do you know what I mean? Like just that acknowledgement that you know that. And I think probably even kind of going through that process, you probably helped quite a few people by just asking the question in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I, we have one, um, rule well like guideline at Quincy where like if, if a teacher ever needs to like use the bathroom or take a quick break all they have to do is call the office and somebody's going to go and fill in for them like that's the, the same concept nobody has ever well I mean probably a handful of times in the six years I've been there have they even you know called the office and needed anything but just knowing that that support mm -hmm. is available and there it just changes our mindset it creates a need satisfying environment at school for teachers which is Step number one in creating a need satisfying environment for students. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, I think that a lot more people are focusing on that as rightfully so. And it's something I've shifted in my language is that like, I've always talked about what's best for kids, but what really was best for kids is really serving the adults to make the right decisions. It's kind of like um, when I fly, right? You'll see like uh, airline companies say like, oh, we always do right by our customers. But then they put people in situations where they can't answer really common sense questions like, oh, I got to talk to this manager and, oh, I could talk to this department, but they don't have a phone. And the reason they don't have a phone <laughs> is because they don't want anyone to talk to you. So they actually, they actually, they say that, um, but then they don't put the people closest to the customers um, to in the situations where they can be successful. It's the same thing with teaching, right? If you really want to help the kids, you got to make sure that the people can have the autonomy to do what they need to do. They have the support uh, and why that's so crucial. When, when you talk about um, one of your big themes and the work that you do is serendipity. And uh, I actually, I, I wonder, like I was first exposed to this term from like some movie about serendipity. I, 
Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, yes, I do. What's John the movie? Cusack What's and the movie? Kate Beck Serendipity. It's John Is it Cusack. Just Serendipity? Kate, yeah, 2001. Kate Beckinsale and who? John Cusack. That's who it was. Yeah. And that's the first time. I wonder if that like term was well known before that movie or it's like, like I didn't I, know that thing until I actually saw that. Right. So, that's where I fell in love with it too. The movie. Well, isn't that, that's the connection is that movie so basically. So like, <laughs> okay. So now, so what does that mean? What does that mean for the people who haven't watched that lovely rom-com? Uh, but also um, like, Talk about serendipity, what it means, and like what, how does this have to do with what we're going through right now? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, serendipity itself is like a, a happy accident. So, it's an event that is um, happy that, you know, we stumble upon. And for me, actually, okay, so I watched the movie in 2001, and I was actually teaching seventh and eighth graders at the time, and I was going to teach them a character education class. And um, we were a William Glasser choice theory school. And so we taught choice theory, which, you know, we don't have to, to go into that. But I knew if I called it character education or if I called it choice theory to these seventh and eighth graders, they would like roll their eyes as they're walking in the door of the classroom. And I just watched the movie and I love the idea of happy accidents and like looking for ha happy accidents in our life. So I called the class serendipity. And um, my latest book is called The Serendipity Journal, and it's a middle grades realistic fiction chapter book. And I actually had my seventh and eighth graders write to me. We wrote back and forth in serendipity journals. Um, and then it was, it was funny because I started my blog, and I, I didn't know what to call it. And I was talking to my secretary, and I'm like, I started this blog. Like, would it be dumb if I called it serendipity in education? Because I've always just been the idea of like if we if we travel through our lives looking for the happy accidents or beautiful lessons and everything we experience, I think that leads to living a richer, more fulfilled, and happier life. And not everything is roses. And I am an optimist, but I do realize that there is a whole spectrum of emotions that we've been given that, um, you know, in themselves are pretty beautiful and can teach us things. And things really suck in the moment. But I also think that if we are continuously looking for the gifts that every experience, like COVID-19 to, you know, my experience of losing my mom to like joys beyond our imagination, like all of those things teach us something. And if we look for them, I think life is much better. So that's my, my take on serendipity. So sort of like a mindset. <laughs> so like that. <laughs> So like that, well, that like, and that's, I think, you know, it is hard. And for me, like for, for me too, and I feel really blessed. Um, and I know I'm in a good situation. I know that many people aren't um, in the same situation that I am to find those moments right now um, with, you know, a lot of pr perspective shifts. We were talking about that before we got on uh, the conversation. So like, even in this tough time, like, how do you encourage people uh, to find this when we also know people are really struggling, when people are literally losing, you know, loved ones? Like, what are some of the things that you'd suggest to people? So I think one of the, the things to do first is to acknowledge that, like, it is okay to, to feel bad. Mm -hmm. Like, I we don't want to pile like guilt on top of like the bad feelings we have. So like there are times when um, like I have, I have just felt bad. You have, everybody has, and it is okay to sit in that for a minute. But then the next step in order to change how we're feeling, you know, we have to change what we're doing and how we're thinking. Like we don't have direct control over our feelings. We can't like wiggle our nose. Like I dream of genie and like change how we're feeling, but we can, take a walk or do laundry or have a conversation with a loved one. And once we change what we're doing and begin to change what we're thinking, then all of a sudden our feelings can follow along. So, I mean, that would be the, the recommend, recommendation I'd have to anybody, which is just to, to think about how can we change what we're doing and what we're thinking. And that leads to that changing how we're feeling. Yeah. And I think for me, like I, I know I've struggled with quite a bit um, with mental health and, you know, when we talk about that, everyone's journey is different, right? Like 
some <laughs> days, to be honest with you, I actually, I don't know if I could say this, if I'm saying this the right way, but some days I actually need to have a really crappy day. Like, it's like, I just need to like, not do something today, not to try to get myself out of this. I just need a little bit of wallowing. And I think I, I want to share that because I think that is, that's part of being human. That's part of who we are and part of the struggle. But I, you know, I do try to, like, I'm thoughtful of like, okay, what did I, like, what did I eat in this day? What did I, um, you know, what exercises I do and to like, see like what things actually maybe made the day harder for me or made the day better for me and trying to be thoughtful of that. Like I actually started journaling quite a bit, which mm -hmm. I, to be honest, you thought was a little crazy before. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like I was like, no, I'm not journaling. Are you kidding? And then it's like, it's helpful. Cause it's just sitting down and thinking about like, why do I feel like this right now? Right. 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 And so like the, the, your, I actually, it's not, your, I don't know if it's your latest um, educator. I think it's your latest educator books. And I think the, the journal um, came out after, yeah. but you talk about like through the lens of serendipity and, it's, it seems to be really relevant to right now. And so can you kind of share a little bit about that book and, and kind of like um, some of the relevance to like what people are going through right now? Yeah, yeah. So the, the book is called Through the Lens of Serendipity. And then it has the longest subtitle, I think, in the history of subtitles, which is helping others discover the best in themselves, even if life has shown them its worst. And that's so, the whole book. That's the whole book. That, that's, that's the whole thing to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really about, um, and, and like you said, George, I, the, it is a book for educators because there are definitely many components that are specific to education, but it's also concepts that can fit into any profession or, or any realm of life. Um, so it's, it's about the motivation behind others' behavior and really how others' behavior is purposeful. It's not often personal. So how somebody behaves might feel personal, but it's really not about me, it's about them. And then there's so many different like lenses and ways to look at others' behavior, relationships, ourselves, so that we can, can understand what is actually motivating our own behavior and others' behavior, and then what, what can we do about it? Um, and then I really, through the lens of serendipity and the path to serendipity, I try to incorporate as many different types of relationships as possible. Mm -hmm. So like in Through the Lens, there's a parent-child relationship, there's co-workers relationship, there's um, student and teacher relationship, there's student-to-student -student relationships, and really looking at those and with the lens of like, what's the purpose in the behavior and how can we support each other? Because I, I, I have a story in the book that is about um, like somebody trimming someone's lawn. So like a neighbor comes over and let's just say at your house, George, a neighbor comes over and is like trimming your hedges or lawn or something like that. And you might hate yard work. And you might look out at that neighbor and be like, bless you. I did not want to do that this week. And that is so awesome. And then somebody who is like, feels maybe defensive, like I'm not doing enough around my house. And oh my gosh, this, they might look out the window and be like, why are you there trimming my hedges? Like, what are you even thinking? Like, I'm not gonna do it. Of course I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it like next week. Like same exact behavior, different lenses and perspectives. And it's because of, you know, just where we are in our lives. It has nothing to do with that guy trimming the hedges. It has everything to do with how I'm feeling about myself and what's going on in my life right now. And that's, that's really, um, that theme is incorporated throughout the book. And just one more thing I'll just point out too is, um, so it's, it's a trauma-informed book and we have lots of trauma-informed books out there. I, I totally recognize that. But this one also, um, I think a really valuable part in this book is really looking colleague to colleague. Like how can we support colleagues who are supporting students in crisis? How can we support colleagues who are going through some challenges at home personally? So it takes that idea of, you know, like a trauma-informed approach or environment and then applies it to the whole school environment yeah i think that for me in education this is something and i've talked about this before uh, as a principal i would really talk to my staff and say like if you need a day like i don't need you to be physically sick for you to get a sick day 
and that to me, you know, cause we, there's a lot of, um, struggles that we have that you can't physically see, but yeah. they don't allow us to be our best selves that day for our kids. And sometimes just that single day off. Um, and I think to be honest with you as an, as an educator, as a teacher, I, I often, I, I know I needed those days and I struggled to take them sometimes. And because I was like, Oh, look at all the work I'm gonna have to do just to take this day. <laughs> right. And so like a lot of teachers will actually avoid that for themselves because of the um, anxious anxiety of all that they have to deal with. And so I like, I really appreciate um, that focus that you have on kind of how we take care of one another because the, the, the default. And I think is, you know, and maybe I shouldn't say that, right. Maybe it's just some of my experience of what we hear is that is something that is your role, Allison, as a principal, but really I'm sure you have days you struggle and you need support and you know, the whole, well, that's, you know, that's how you get to pay the big box. It's kind of like a dismissive statement. I'm sure you need support too, but I think as well, um, we, we need, you know, in a classroom, it'd be great if we can, we all support our kids, but we also want to create the environment where the kids support one another too. And so it's no different on a staff. Right. And I think that, yeah, it's great. We want to know that our principal supports us, but I also want to know the person across the hall has got my back too. And they're there for me. And, you know, they see me as a person, uh, not just a colleague. And I think that's something, you know, like what are some ways that you could actually, you know, like be strategic about that, you know, kind of setting up that support from colleague to colleague. I think, you know, what you talked about first, modeling that, I think every time I've sent out that check-in, I get at least one teacher commenting back, thank you for always asking how we're doing. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that's that's the the modeling from a leadership perspective. But then I think it's also important to to talk about it and have conversations of, you know, I, I might snap at a colleague because I'm having a rough day. Like, don't hold that in and harbor it until, you know, you're about to blow, come talk to me about it. And mm-hmm. like, and, and then just like giving tools of like, we can go up to somebody and say, are you mad at me? Like, it just, it kind of feels like you're mad at me. And that can open, that, that might be an easy way to open the door to a conversation about, you know, like that, that snap that happened before. And just, I th- we do a lot of talking about, we are the Q crew and we have this set of values. What is what do those values look like in the lounge? What do they look like mm-hmm. when we have a staff member who is going through a challenge at home? What do they look like when we have a staff member who has a student going who's going through a crisis and is so scared of how everybody's judging them because they can't control the student? You know, and then of course, what does it look like teacher to student or student to student? And really making sure that we're fulfilling what we value in, in every relationship in every area of the school. And people need that like right now more than ever, right? Like we need to be able to lean on each other more than ever, even though it's harder to see each other face to face, but you know, just is as important, if not more so. And so Allison, the one question I ask everybody and really appreciate your openness and the sharing of your stories, but what's like one, like one piece of advice you give to people right now in education as we're going uh, through all of this? I connect. <laughs> we still need to connect. I had, and I, I'm doing, you know, whole group Zoom staff meetings, and they're fine. I really actually don't like them that much because there's so little connection in it, and I do most of the talking. Um, but the small group staff meetings that we get together, like in our grade level teams, um, or like with our support staff, those conversations have kept us, like, have maintained our relationships because I value so much just walking around the school and saying, hey, I'm thinking about this. What are your thoughts? Or somebody suggested this. What do you think about that? And having like those kind of conversations are so important to continuing to have the same culture as we can't be together. So connect. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I appreciate drop. that. And Allison, <laughs> you know, as I'm, like, I'm, as I'm listening to you, right? And th- I, I feel, to be honest with you, like really validated in, in some of the work that I do. And I'll, I'll explain to you why, why I mean by that. So one of the things that I really try to get people to do is really do what you said is connect. 
and share these amazing stories and share all these things. And then, you know, years ago we met, you do this. And so I'm sitting here and I'm just thinking, how blessed am I? Not just all the other people learn from you, but am I that I get to listen to you and learn all the incredible stuff from you? Because that to me, like the whole thing is I see, I have these incredible conversations with people. I have these, you know, you know, on individual level, but the world is so much better uh, in education and, and outside as well, because your willingness to share, your willingness to tell these stories. So like, I'm so grateful that we connected years ago because I'll tell you the world of education is better um, as you share your stories with it, Allison. I think it's really uh, powerful. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you know that I feel this the same way about you. And, and I just want to circle back to a question you asked me about that, that like that being vulnerable and putting that first blog post out or putting that first, um, book out and I, just to encourage you know anybody who's listening like I didn't think I had anything to share and you don't think you do until you start sharing and that's and, and you can't really get out uh, get the most out of the connections unless it's a two-way street that you're sharing and then also learning so um, I just appreciate so much your encouragement to Put myself out there and, and not just me but so many others but he, and this is what, one thing i'll say about about what you just said you say you don't have anything to share but you would never say that if you were interviewing for a job sometimes right. we sometimes we say that just to not just to because we're we're, t we're terrified of like what other people think but every person listening to this if i said hey what's something really powerful that you do in your teaching in an interview you'd have no problem answering that question such a good point Yes. Right? And so yeah. I think that to me, I think it's sometimes it's like, Hey, we, we put up this wall because we will say it in an interview on one-on-one, -on -one, but um, I, I referred to this video so many times the last few days, even though it's probably like 10 years old, uh, the idea of obvious to you, amazing to others. Mm -hmm. um, some of the stuff that Allison, I know for you is second nature and the way that you connect is not necessarily second nature for other people, but it's benefited so many and because of your willingness to share. And so uh, I'll reiterate what Allison said to people listening to this, you have amazing things to share to a tremendous group of people. So we hope, we hope that, you know, listening to this conversation, um, we, I would love that someone say, you know, Allison, I listened to you on George's podcast and I decided to start a blog. And I, oh, love I would love that too. Out. That'd be the best. <laughs> well, anyways, Allison, thank you so much for being here today. I, I really enjoyed it. I actually almost started crying at the end. So I don't, oh. know, if, I don't know if I'm happy <laughs> if I'm mad at you for making me do that, but um, probably mad. Probably. But yeah. it was awesome to talk to you and I hope, um, stay safe in Michigan. I hope your, um, your family's well and really appreciate it. And I look forward and make sure, um, if you look in the links, you'll see links to Allison's books uh, and Allison's Twitter and her blog. And so make sure you connect with Allison. So Allison, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, my friend. Have a wonderful day, everybody.